Life is unfair. This became the running motif in Famisha's life, because in her world, people received magic blessings at the age of five. Blessings ranked by number of stars, with three stars being the highest and most coveted in their society. She was blessed with the skill to tame monsters, only with zero stars, a completely and utterly worthless rank, as she couldn't even tame small, meekly animals. The acceptance in the village she grew up in became rejection. The love she received from her parents became hate. She was forced to flee from her hometown while being chased by bounty hunters employed by her village. She changes her name to Ivy to take on a new identity. She cuts her hair so she can pass as a boy to avoid the hunters. She hasn't given up on life because there is something special about her. She was reincarnated from our world into the girl she is now, and the voice of her past gives her advice on how to live and who to be. She eventually meets a tiny slime who she befriends named Sora. And now the weakest duo is on a quest to reach the capital, where she's been told she'll receive the purpose she's been missing. This is a heartfelt tale of the weakest tamer began a journey to pick up trash. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. We see Ivy as she runs into the forest. She sets up pots and pans to clang in the trees when someone comes by. She pulls some hidden bags out from a secret area that only she knows about and stares with a look of wonder as they get sucked into one of the bags. She straps all the bags onto herself and packs in other various items. As she walks out with all of her wares, she says to herself she gave up on happiness a long time ago, being an unwanted child who was cast away by her parents. She tries to test the blade she's holding but ends up tumbling and rolling backwards. If only she had important skills like running or hiding, but if she did, then of course, none of this would have happened to her in the first place. She wonders if she had done something in her past life to have been cursed so badly in this one. She slides down the hill, happy to find a dumping ground. She tugs on a bag handle from the dumpster to almost get pierced by several thrown away spears. Inside of a bag, she's delighted to find a new jacket and a map that might make her journey easier. But even with the positive outlook, she has intrusive thoughts to remind her she's just an unwanted child living off of trash like a hobo. Ivy then sees a man who is a monster tamer. He whistles to call in slimes to feed on the trash and as she watches them melt the garbage away, she wonders if her past life would have thought of monsters as cute. She runs away to hide as the man comes towards the back of the dumpster. She stares completely frightened as the man mentions there's a bounty on this little girl's head, where the head of her village wants her back dead or alive. She flees further, having restless nights, and while crossing a marsh, a strong gust blows and she finds dozens of slimes jumping around her. She runs away with them chasing after, she makes it to the forest and stumbles backwards with more slimes appearing before her, falling down a cliff with her fall broken by the branches of a large tree. She heals herself with some potions, hoping the chase on her has ended. She then makes it to some beautiful stream water, where she dives in to bathe. Afterwards, she cuts her hair and puts on clothes to disguise herself as a boy, staring out into the water, ready to begin her new life. She comes upon a tiny slime on a leaf that she actually finds cute. Then, when she goes through her monster compendium, it turns out to be extremely rare, only being known as the weakest slime with a disintegrating existence. She can't help but rejoice because the slime is just as weak and useless as she is. Finally, someone for her to relate to. A small breeze blows, dragging the small slime away, and looking at the compendium again, Ivy learns the slime can disappear from even a heavier gust or even the slightest touch as she stares at it being stuck or merely being put upside down. Ivy gently puts the slime right side up using both her hands and learns from the book that it's likely this slime will die within a day, making the slime very sad. Then the wind blows a blade of grass that knocks over the weak, useless slime and Ivy chases after it, barely catching the slime before it falls in the water. She then spends her time with the slime as much as possible before its inevitable disintegration. She talks to it, mentioning her thoughts on how gods don't play fair. They make people who are happy, but also people who are miserable like her in this slime. The humans in this world, known as Ortogas, all receive skills when they turn 5 years old. Her father has 2 star carpentry skills, her mother has 2 star needlework and 1 star mending skills. However, no one knows what kind of skills they receive or how many stars they'll be in value until they appear. But everyone's future is decided by those skills and the number of stars. At the age of 5, Ivy received the taming skill, which is the ability to tame monsters and win them over. But sadly, she was born starless, a tamer who cannot tame a single monster, useless and outcasted by society, and her family, they stopped giving 
giving her food and a house to sleep in, she slowly found herself with no place to belong. However, she does have one thing that others don't, memories of her past life. She's apparently a human who was reincarnated here from a different world, but most of the memories come hazy and tend not to be of much use either. They often even whisper things to her she doesn't quite understand, like proverbs. The only person who was still nice to Ivy was the fortune teller. She had given Ivy books that taught her many different things, and even this magic bag that can store many items. But unfortunately, the fortune teller died recently, so there's no one left in this world for Ivy. And everyone from the village is trying to find and kill her, even though she had done nothing wrong. Is being starless that bad? Is it something that she should truly be hated for? Is the world rejecting Ivy's very existence? She then stares at the slime, remarking on how it's fated to disappear within a single day. The world just isn't fair. The next morning, she wakes up, scurrying to find the little slime, saddened by the only thing she could relate to, disappearing. Even though she thought she was used to being lonely, she couldn't help but tear up. She starts going through her bags, remembering how the fortune teller told her to march towards the royal capital. Then, when she checks her map, she's relieved to find the slime still alive. She learns from her compendium that in order to tame a monster, she must first give it some of her magical energy. If the monster accepts it, it'll begin to glow, and the monster must then receive a name during that phase. She wonders if she can really do this, being starless and all. She then imbues the slime with magic and gives it the name Sora, meaning sky to represent the blue sky above her. With the name being a success, she's excited to journey with her cute little friend, embracing her own name of Ivy, the plant that thrives even when it's stomped on. The next day, a mouse wanders in a little contraption. It's the tenth one that Ivy's caught. She's overjoyed to have field mice for a meal tonight. She wraps the mice in some leaves and stores them in her bag for later. She points on her map to where she currently is, the area of her hometown, Latomi Village, and notes that the royal capital is way further on the left past this map. So she wants to stop in the town of Tola before the map cuts off. She has to catch Sora again before the breeze blows him away. She then gets startled by some scurrying and decides to run up a tree to hide. And she's horrified to see a large herd of huge ants, but they don't notice her at all. After they leave, she holds up Sora, wondering if he seems a little bigger. And after noticing she's got a cut on her cheek, she heals herself with some potions, but can't help but think that she should have more potions and wonders where the rest went. As she wanders, she sees a wanted poster with her face on it. She notices the reward is 500 Dao, which is a big reward where they're from. She wonders why she could be worth so much. Then her past self whispers that it's because she's a wanted fugitive, which doesn't make Ivy any happier since it makes her sound like a villain. She goes to take a second wanted poster down and is flabbergasted to see their ugly depiction of her and it makes her pretty mad so she rips it up. However, when seeing her beautified one, she remarks, yeah, this one, it's probably me. But somehow it seems Sora may disagree. They finally arrive in the next town with Ivy feeling a little envious over all the townsfolk and their everyday magic. She sees a butcher shop and thinks about selling her field mice for some cash. She gets nervous and decides to walk away, but the butcher comes over as he can smell the mice due to his own level 2 odor skill. He has Ivy show him the mice and is excited over the fresh cuts of meat. He buys them for 100 dao, explaining that most people are bringing him bigger game these days, so he'd be happy to buy the smaller meats from Ivy at any time. With a pocket full of cash, Ivy gets a little hungry looking at the bread shop, but she's too nervous so she walks away at first. But then she comes back, with the shop owner asking what she would like to buy. Ivy asks what she can afford with a hundred dao, as it turns out she's never used money before. So the owner explains Ivy could buy the entire shelf of bread with a hundred dao. She then decides to buy a couple things and takes off happily with the delicious treats. That evening, she sits atop a tree, very eager to eat. Then, she splits off half for Sora. As she enjoys herself, she learns that Sora can't eat the bread, but she can't comprehend what he might like eating at all. The next day, she is overjoyed to find a mound of trash. She comes upon baskets of potions, but they're all expired and discolored. But when she sets them down, Sora finds a use by absorbing the potion bottles whole. This surprises Ivy because absorbing inorganic material is usually a skill only held by high-level rare slimes. She decides to test this with another piece of trash, but it seems Sora is only interested in potion bottles. But not red ones, just blue potion. They continue their days in the village, with Ivy bringing more mice meat to the butcher to make money and buying more bread to enjoy, then bathing in the nearby river every day. As they eat their meals for the day, Ivy wishes she could stay in the village forever. 
The people here treat her nice. Unlike the memories of her father who discarded her like the trash she's become more endearing of. The next day, she heads into the village and when she sees some adventurers, she thinks of the man who was hunting her for a bounty and she runs away. She runs past the butcher who is eager to buy some mice, but she becomes frightened to see her wanted poster on the shop stall. She then runs to the bread shop where the bread lady baked her favorite bread to give her some. However, Ivy runs away again, feeling worse after seeing a second poster. She cries that night because she knows she must leave the village that's been treating her so well, and embraces Sora who keeps her company while she sleeps. The next day, when she ventures out, she comes to crossroads, unsure of where to go. She decides to go grab a bite to eat, since she was too scared to pick up supplies in the town. She's delighted to come upon a golden apple tree, but now isn't so happy to see it's a monster that feasts on adventurers. Ivy tries to flee, but scrapes by with a vicious attack on her wrist. Then, with Ivy lying on the ground, ready to pass out from the pain, Sora begins to light up, and Ivy can't help but think, that's right, slimes eat people as well. We see a man carving wood. He hears a baby crying, so runs upstairs to the midwife holding their healthy little baby girl. The man's wife, Fulfei, asks him what name he should give her. He responds, for Misha, as the baby giggles, embraced by the love of the mother at her bedside. A few years later, Misha would grow into a kind and wonderful girl, bringing her father and older brother lunch as they worked hard for their family. As the three enjoyed their tasty bread lunch, Misha nearly choked from eating too fast, so her father used his magic to fill her cup with water so she could clear her throat properly. Even though her brother would scold her, Misha would continue to eat wildly, claiming it's because she's a growing girl, which caused her father to laugh. His family brought him so much joy. That evening, Misha would come home to her mother and older sister, Vasilla, preparing dinner. Her brother, Feton, teased her for saying she better start being able to use everyday magic. So Misha retorted that she'll definitely be able to soon, with her mother gently reminding her that everyone develops at their own pace. And even without magic, Misha is already admirably helping out as much as she can. However, Vasilla comments that's not what their mom said to her when she was four years old. She was being told by their mother every day to hurry up and be able to use magic already, with the mother applying huh? Is that really how it was? Parents, am I right? Dinner is set for the family to enjoy. A big stew was the main course. The father proudly explains that since Vasilla has the soothing skill, the food is enhanced with the ability to cure fatigue. Then the family enjoys their peaceful dinner together. The family continues to work on things throughout the evening. The father mentions the house he'd been building should be finished by the end of the month, but he couldn't complete it without his lovely family that was truly blessed in this world. Their son Fetan made the furniture with his three-star furniture making skills, and the mother helped with the furniture cushions using her two-star sewing skills. Their family was truly blessed with talent for the homemaking business. As the mother worked, a tear came to her eye, which startled Fomisha. Turns out, the mother had been stitching bridal wear for the shoemaker's daughter, and this made her realize that Fomisha and her older sister Priscilla will be married off someday too. Priscilla is eager to have a beautiful dress, while the father says it's too soon. But no, the mother knows the time always comes faster than you'd expect. After all, Fomisha is almost five years old, which makes Fomisha excited for birthday presents. However, there's something even more important coming that day, her skill. The father remarks that as long as a person has a skill, they'll always find a place to work. The mother adds, what sort of skill and how many stars? No one knows until they receive their skills from the gods. The type of skill and number of stars will determine where you work, where someone like your older brother Fetan, who has three star skills is highly desired. Unlike Vasilla, who is only one star, which he constantly teases her for. The mother then asks Fomisha what skill she'd like. From very early on, Fomisha had always wanted to be a tamer, to befriend dragons, griffins, and all sorts of monsters, causing her brother to laugh as he felt her reasoning to be ridiculous. The father reminded Fomisha that skills are bestowed by the gods so its people can live in this world, causing Fomisha to pout since he also told her it's not for her to make friends with monsters. However, he handed her a horse he made with his two-star carpentry skills in order to cheer her up. The family hears a knock on the door. Who could it be at this hour? Turns out, it's Mistress Luba, the fortune teller. She showed up because it's nearly time for Fermisha to be gifted with her skill and has come to offer prayer of good fortune. The fortune teller then thinks back to when Fermisha was much younger. The mother had been concerned because Fermisha started speaking incredibly well since the age of two and that sometimes 
for Misha would say strange things. The mother couldn't help but feel concerned, wondering if her daughter would be able to use magic someday. For Misha then suddenly burst out, Magic? This world has magic? Something that Luba affirms to little Famisha. Famisha jumps with joy, then says, What? Reincarnated into another world, which leaves the mother concerned over the strange words her daughter had just spoken. Luba then reassures the mother, It's fine. Famisha will grow into a very intelligent child. Luba then makes an excuse so the mother can step away for a second. That way, she can privately inquire about Famisha. She tells Famisha that if people learn she has memories of her past life, things will become difficult for her. So so she mustn't tell anyone about them. She must keep it a secret, even from her own mother. Back in the present, Luba tells the family Famisha is sure to be gifted with a wonderful skill. Vasila wonders if Foresight tells Luba what skill Famisha will get. However, with Luba's skill being only one star, she can't see quite that far. Fetan then mocks Luba's one star, causing the father to scold his bratty son. After all, without her predictions, the village wouldn't know when they'd be able to harvest the Zaro fruit. We finally reach the day of Famisha's fifth birthday. Her parents sit with her as the village priest says to them, Today is the day to receive her blessings from God. Blessings that will grant her the joy of hard work, happiness at the wonder of living, and divine protection of truth. Famisha walks up to touch the sacred water. Then the priest uses his magic to receive the divine message. Famisha is blessed with the tamer skill, the ability to win monsters over to her, which got both her and her parents excited. This was going exactly how Famisha wished. However, this dream would become a nightmare, as the priest gave a very disturbed look at the reading. The water burst before them, meaning this child possesses a starless tamer skill. Her parents protested. Her father shouted, This must be some kind of mistake. My daughter couldn't possibly be starless. But the priest assured him, This is a divine message. Mistakes simply aren't possible, and that any further talk like this is blasphemy. As the priest walked away, muttering under his breath that this girl has been abandoned by the gods, Formisha hears a whisper from her past life, saying, This is an impossibly hard mode video game. Back at home, the family sits completely depressed and disheveled. The father slams the table, having been drinking non-stop. The mother tells him he's had too much, but he ignores her, wondering how this could all have possibly happened. Both him and his wife have stars. Their oldest son and daughter have stars. Why does Famisha have none? Famisha tries to ask him something, but he shouts back at her, telling her not to speak because the starless have been abandoned by the gods. He truly questioned how a starless could be born in his family, which made Famisha stare in disbelief, with the man before her no longer having the love and warmth provided she had always known. Fulfe tells him he's going too far as he quickly gets up. He grabs the wooden horse he gave to Famisha and slams it on the ground, shouting, What's the point of being a tamer if she has no stars? He wonders if Famisha is even really his daughter, and with these harsh words, Fulfe falls to the ground in tears. Famisha tries to console her mother, but Fetan grabs her, shouting not to touch his mom. Famisha tries to ask her older sister for help, but Facilla only gives her a nasty look, with Famisha screaming that her brother is hurting her, begging him to stop. He throws her on the ground and yells at her to get out. She looks back at him, completely lost in everything that's transpired, but then she runs out the door. Famisha then walks through the village like a lifeless zombie, all while the villagers speak in hushed whispers about the starless child abandoned by God. The village head announces the appearance of a starless to be a horrible omen of disaster. He tells the villagers they must prepare against the misfortunes and devote their abilities to the good of the village. As Famisha watches them, the other kids in the village throw rocks at her, causing her to bleed. She runs, only to be faced with more villagers staring at her with hateful eyes. She ran all night through a forest to get away from them, wondering why this was happening until she tripped. She can't go home anymore. Her past self whispers there's going to be a witch hunt which makes Famisha clench her fist as it rains. She says to herself, she's not a witch. As she wanders in the rain depressed and cold, she thinks to herself, she's getting hungry too. She comes across some berries and eats what she can, but still shivers from the sopping cold. She breaks a stick and tries to use magic for the first time to make a fire, but it goes out. As she tries to light it a second time, she suddenly passes out. She wakes up to the fortune teller who helped warm her with the fire and prepared food to eat. Luba tells Famisha it seems she has less magical energy than most people and that if she ever runs out, it will put her life at risk. She then tells Famisha that her foresight skill showed this was going to happen to her, just not the way it was going to happen. But she never imagined Famisha to be starless as she hands food over for Famisha to enjoy. After dinner, she hands a magic bag to Famisha, and even though it's an older model, it will still be able to fit a lot of things in it, and also books with knowledge about various useful things. Luba then says Famisha is destined to take a journey to see the world and broaden her perspective, that she must head to a town neighbor 
neighboring the royal capital and find people that she can trust. And that when she does, she must tell them everything, even that she's a starless. That way, she can find true friends who will accept her no matter what. As Hermesha learns various skills from Luba, she asks why Luba doesn't hate her like the rest of the village. Luba explains that long ago, no one had skills or stars, but still worked and lived happily. So not having skills isn't a bad thing, even though she doesn't know how things ended up like this. Three years later, we find Famisha in front of a huge trash pile. She wonders if the planks are left over from her older brother Phaeton's furniture making, storing some away to use for firewood later. She then stares at some potions, which are used but still enough to be stored away for later. She got a huge haul today. She catches a mouse and enjoys a skewer from it afterwards. She thinks it's been a while since she'd last seen the fortune teller and wonders what she's doing. She then senses the presence of people coming and puts her fire out and hides to see two men from the village. She has a bad feeling and wants to know why people are coming after her. So she decides to spy on them in town. She hears two women talk about how it was a shame that Luba had died from sickness recently, which surprised her. She sees her father report to the village head that he still hasn't been able to find Fermisha, and the village head remarks that Fermisha must have caught wind of what they were trying to do. The head tells Fermisha's father that starless only bring misfortune, and her father agrees, saying starless should not be allowed to exist in this world. This broke her emotionally, hearing the words from the same man that used to love her, causing her to fall into despair. She even imagines her mother saying, it would have been better if she'd never been born. The head of the village talks about the sad loss of the village fortune teller, saying the cause of her death was none other than the curse of the starless, and that because Luba ignored his warnings and looked after Fermisha, she also became forsaken by the gods. They cannot afford to leave Fermisha unchecked, as their village will one day be struck by calamity, and then he commands them all to capture and kill her. Fermisha shrunk in fear at the harsh bounty being placed on her life. She ran as the villagers chased after her, with her mother restraining her. As her father delivered the finishing blow, she woke up under the stars, remembering that Sora was going to eat her. She then stares back at the sky and peacefully accepts her fate, because she's an unwanted child anyways. Next, she finds herself awakened by Sora nudging her. He bounces on top of her, and that's when Fermisha notices her wound is completely healed. She thanks him as she learned he wasn't trying to eat her. He was actually just healing her. And this is when he began to speak. So Fermisha rejoices and laughs at her little slime that can only say poo poo. She may be an unwanted child, but none of that matters as long as she has him. So maybe she'll decide to live just a little longer. Another day comes and we see Ivy resting peacefully. A droplet of morning dew falls and hits Sora, waking him up. He spams his poo poo phrase over and over again, like an alarm clock. So Ivy grabs him to turn him off. Of course, she would have no idea what that even is in this world, but her past life does. She pets the energetic little Sora on this fine morning, and she cheers, eager for the two of them to continue their journey. Berries and blue potions, Ivy prays to say gratitude for the fine morning meal. The two enjoy themselves, but Ivy is surprised at how much energy her little slime seems to have now. She grabs him close and remarks on how much sturdier he is than before. Is this really the same disintegrating slime that she knew? Maybe he's grown after consuming all of those blue potions. Well, none of that really matters, as long as he's healthy. Ivy begins to think about the next village they'll be entering. She's been low on meat supplies since leaving the last village, so she'll need to hunt more mice to sell. But her past self tells her if she cooks the mice she catches, she'll actually save more money. Which would be a good idea, except the smell of food would eventually attract monsters. So even with a higher cost, buying dry meat from the store is safer. Then suddenly, Sora keeps shouting his phrase over and over. He's finished all the potions and he wants even more, leaving Ivy to wonder what she's going to do. Well, if you were all wondering what's next, allow me to remind you the name of the anime. Ivy is excited to find a large pile of trash. She starts digging through, hoping to find Sora some food, but instead gets distracted by the hand-me-downs. She remembers she needs to stay on track, so she looks around some more and finds a big pile of used potions. Comparing the blue potions, this one looks new, and this one looks a little too old. But the age of the blue potion doesn't matter to Sora, he'll eat them all. He then consumes a red one, something he wouldn't consume before. So she tries testing a green potion that acts as a painkiller, and a purple potion that removes curses, but Sora doesn't want either of those ones. Her past self then advises her to try mixing the colors, so she combines red and blue to make the limitless purple. Uh, I mean, 
purple potion, and Sora eats that too. However, he wants nothing to do with a regular purple potion. They then head on their way with Sora bouncing and rolling around, and Ivy is so happy because she thought she'd always travel alone, always live alone, but now she'll always have Sora. She gets excited to see some berries and gushes over the delicious taste. She tries to offer some to Sora, but he isn't too excited. Later that evening, the two enjoy dinner, but Sora eats potions non-stop, all the way to the point that Ivy is concerned she won't have any potions left for herself. So her past self gives the advice, if you're sleeping, you can't be eating. Ivy takes the advice to heart, and atop a tree branch, she begins to tell Sora a bedtime story, her favorite one from when she was little. Long, long ago, the world was at war. One day, the king gathered together magicians who could see the future and had them all make predictions about how the war would end. The future they saw was the end of the world, a truly terrifying sight. The magicians discussed their visions, and then, in order to protect the world, they cast powerful magic. No one knows what that magic was, and no one can use it now. The only one who can is a child who comes from another world, as it's a forgotten magic. Magic that is vast and scary and quiet, lonely and untouchable, Dewdrop falls again, waking up Sora like the little alarm he is, so Ivy pats him to make him stop. However, she gets upset with herself waking up to find Sora had already eaten all of her potions. She nabs some mice in a mouse trap. Just kidding, she accidentally catches a big snake. She's reluctant to deal with it, but she knows it might still fetch her some money if she sells it, so she grabs a cloth from her magic bag and covers the snake, confining it with a knot. Walking through a path, she smells something burning while Sora freaks out over it. She's curious as to what it is and decides to check it out, only to see a caravan that had been completely wrecked by some bandits. She decides to hide Sora in her bag, and when she looks in further, she's horrified to find some men who'd been bloodied and battered. No way bandits would do this. This had to be the work of monsters. Ivy decides to make a run for it until she's far away, panting and completely out of breath. She spots Letum and makes her way into town. And even though she's safe now, she feels like she has to tell someone. She spots the sign for a town hall, and even though she's nervous, she enters. The people from town hall ask the little boy, Ivy, what she's got there. She tells them it's a snake she caught, but that's not important. Ivy then tells them about the people she found passed out on the way here, the cart that was on fire, and the people who had been attacked and didn't survive. A man walks up to Ivy to get a better account of what had happened, hoping the attackers were only bandits. But after hearing about how the horses were also killed instead of stolen, he reluctantly agrees it was most likely a monster attack. The man then tells everyone to locate the monsters as soon as possible, and he thanks Ivy, explaining she'll be rewarded as soon as the monsters are found. And the woman explains, in this town, people are rewarded for giving monster tip-offs to town hall. It's to give the town countermeasures, before people can get hurt. The woman gives Ivy a document to claim her reward once the task has been completed. Ivy then goes to sell the snake she caught, and the buyer tells her it's a rare female and offers to give her three giddle. Ivy has to count, and has since learned the value is equivalent to 300 dao, or selling 30 field mice. She walks out happy with her collected money, and now's the time to find food for Sora. She, of course, heads to another dump, and becomes so happy as she finds over 21 magic bags. She's at first concerned, unsure of how she can carry them all, so she starts trying to fill the magic bags with each other. Then, she starts organizing them, with bags on the left unable to carry other magic bags, followed by magic bags that can carry one magic bag, then magic bags that can carry two magic bags, and all the way on the right, magic bags that can carry three magic bags. She eventually finishes organizing them and heads back into town to buy more potions. The man from earlier greets her and thanks her as they were able to verify the monster tip right away. Turns out the monsters were ogres and an ogre king based on the tracks they had found. They ended up sending high-ranked adventurers to go slay them, and no one is to leave the village until the monsters have been defeated. He then tells Ivy to head to town hall and collect her reward. And after handing in her document, the town hall lady hands her over five giddle. Oh wow, the snake was worth three giddle or 30 mice. At five giddle, that's 50 mice's worth. But it's not over, as she's also awarded two ladol. One ladol is 10 giddle, so altogether she's collected 280 field mice worth of money. Later that night, she chills for the evening, eating berries and feeding Sora in her bag. 
She'll have to stay in town until the monster hunt is over, but she's happy regardless. With Sora still at her side, she decides to rest for the night. Watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.